well, the CES meeting didn't happen, so we're doing this instead, which is actually kind of appropriate since we're actually looking at CES today. Um, <laughs> uh, Aaron Davis of MetaMask has produced for us a pull request that would um, re, uh, it replace the eight magic lines with four with blocks, which we're cur currently calling the four, what? With quadruple blocks. backflip. The quadruple backflip or the four backflips of the apotheosis. I, Aaron wow. keeps changing the branding for this, but the point of it is that this would allow us to eliminate the possibility of leaking the what we currently have is called the scope proxy. And uh, thank you, Matthew, for showing this. This is the heart of it. We're changing the eight magic lines into however many magic lines this is. Okay. Um, the idea is that by taking what was just the scope proxy and then creating four layers out of it, we create, for one, a more auditable artifact where each of these individual layers can be evaluated for their, um, their isolated purpose. Um, but also, most importantly, when you access a name, a free variable from within a CES program, uh, it will the and uh, pardon when you access a free name corresponding to a function and then call that function the in sloppy mode which we're well pardon in in the mode of execution that we are in <laughs> if under sess uh, by whatever name it is that uh, the the rule is that the this object will be bound to whatever object it was extracted from on the with block Currently, that's the scope proxy. So we leak the scope proxy. With this change, if you receive, if you get a free variable and it corresponds to a property of the global object, your the, your receiver will be bound to the global object, which is also incorrect in terms of what we want, which would be a high fidelity emulation of what happens inside of a JavaScript module. That is to say, undefined. But leaking the global object is less risky. Um, albeit not less insecure, uh, because what we have is secure. We just would reveal the global object instead. Um, that is, uh, so, so basically what Aaron has done is he's taken the work that I did, I think in January, but wasn't able to pull over the line in a weekend and finished the job. Um, so the way that it's peeled off in this is eval scope is an object that is solely responsible for allowing the unsafe eval to pop out once on line 70 and then deny it thereafter. Um, and then the global lexicals serve as either the lexical environment of a module or the lexical environment that, uh, that was pr uh, passed into the, um, the compartment constructor or a combination of the two. Um, the global object is the compartment's global this and the scope let, term- let, 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 me, let me interrupt you. The global yep. lexicals include for our module translation, it includes the um, the assignment interceptor for propagating live bindings? Yes. Okay. Yeah, global lexicals is doing double duty. Okay. Um, and the scope terminator is actually one of two different things now. Uh, this is the only proxy and it is the proxy that will only be reached if you have a free variable that isn't doesn't correspond to a global or a lexical or that eval once. Um, and that means that in this implementation, the scope terminator can either be an opaque object that just refuses to give you anything and claims to have anything, um, which basically which which effectively masks the scope from anything in the real global this and can be shared across compartments safely because it has absolutely no state whatsoever. It's just a, it's just a closed door. Or if you're in sloppy globals mode, um, you get a scope proxy that uh, that forwards assignment to the global object. Um, and that's that's the design. And when you say the global object, you mean the object that's that's on line sixty four. Yes, the compartment's global. This. Okay, so the. Um, so the scope terminator um, in the not in the sloppy globals mode, presumably it always says has true. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it in, does. In the, in the other mode, does it also always say has true? Uh, currently, no, it, it's not changing the behavior, but, uh, or I don't know, actually. Uh, I guess so. We'll so <laughs> it, yeah, we will see that in this review. But what I'm expecting to find when looking at this is that uh, Aaron has not changed the behavior from what we currently have. The behavior we currently have is that it returns true only if the um uh if the 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 realms uh the, the realms global this has the property so if the if the if the realms global this does not have the property on it I directly or on its prototype chain um it'll uh it'll return false which is presumably safe because that should always turn into a reference error just farther up um but has the downside of leaking uh information about the shape of the global this to guest code uh and Aaron, it, still, it still doesn't make um the un, un unreferenced variable versus type of uh, be spec compliant because there's nothing we can do to make it spec compliant. So I actually don't understand what the purpose is of ever uh, having that say have, has say false. It's so that, that you actually uh, do get a uh, reference error. But you, if, you also get the reference error on the type of type of unreferenced variable, which is wrong. No. Wait, what? If if foo is an undeclared variable, uh -huh. that the expression type of foo, according to the JavaScript spec, should return the string undefined. Uh -huh. But it's impossible for the shim to do that and at the same time have just the expression foo cause a reference error or throw a reference error. Right. Yeah. So, so, it, so no matter what we do, we can't make those two things together be spec compliant. So I don't understand why we want the reference error. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, there are two things on that. Um, but the, probably the most important one is that that is a separable concern from this PR. And Aaron experimented with doing both fixes at the same time and ran into complications, which I'm sure we'll get to hear about when we talk okay. to him. Okay. Um, so he chose not to address that in this PR. And we'll see if we if we'll see if the text is is consistent with that. Okay. All right. So well, the first piece of code I ended up looking at is the eval scope, um, which is this. And when reading this, my concern was that the one-time eval properties is in charge of deleting from eval scope, but we really trust the caller of create eval scope to add the one-time properties to eval scope. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a bit of a split brain here that if the caller ends up putting these on something else, we won't be deleting on access. Would you be satisfied if the contents of this file moved into the file where it was used? Um, either that or remove the one-time evil properties and export a uh, init type thing uh, that does the, uh, the operation of adding the properties to the evil scope. I think that uh, that was in a prior design. And the reason that we went in this direction was to avoid um, bumping the stack because we don't want, um, well, that's, there are two bumping, separate. Bumping the stack, the stack is safe there. Yeah, bumping the stack is safe there. It's not safe for deleting. Um, so. Right. In the previous design, there were two functions, one to delete the property and one to add the property. Um, I, I, yeah, actually... I guess we, we have encapsulated the concern of deleting it, except in the case of the finally block. Um, 
where we redundantly delete it just to be sure. Yeah. Um, let, my, let, me, my... let, me, let me verify that the absence of a setter means that an assignment fails. Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, that is good. Also will never happen. Um, if this, it, 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 by design, that should never be possible. Right. Because the first thing that happens is that you access, you access eval and then it deletes the property. And then if you were to set eval, um, then it will go higher up the chain. The, uh, and I believe that Aaron was kind enough to add tests to that effect to make sure. Okay. And the reason why we're concerned about, uh, as you, you said, bumping the stack, um, meaning um, uh, ha having a procedure call, a function call, uh, is that we're worried about what happens if you're on the edge of running out of stack memory, correct? And, and to be honest, I'm, I'm, I am concerned anyway of, I mean, calling a getter is technically, uh, it, it is bumping the stack. So now, yes. uh, it, Technically, we're bumping the stack in the getter, uh, yeah. but not bumping the stack before. So we're, we're actually um, we're actually in this case already. So do we um, do we if we went with uh, unscopables? If we, if we went with instead of having eval scope do this, instead had an eval scope that had an unscopables property, a symbol unscopables property that we added and removed eval from, would we be able to avoid? bumping the stack with that technique? I believe so, because the unscopables is, uh, it could just be a plain property um, that we and, uh, uh, change. And the properties uh, of the unscope. Yeah, and the properties yeah. of the object it refers to are also just direct. There's no function call. Yeah, there would be no function call anywhere. Yeah, OK. I'm in favor of that. Um, I, yeah, I don't sorry. particularly care whether it happens in this PR or not. Uh, I understand logically what, why that's preferable. It terrifies me to leave the dangerous eval in place and depend only on unscopables to hide it. Um, is right. that because we can't rely on unscopables to be implemented by the engine? No, it's because it's because it's not oh, actually. Being, it's not being hit. The thing about deleting it is once it's deleted, it's gone. It's not it's not reachable. So you can just sort of use direct reachability reasoning to know that you can't get to it. Uh, Whereas well, leaving it. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Technically, we do still pass through the eval scope for every property access. It's just that it's devoid of properties. Well, it, it's devoid of properties in the code as it is as 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 that we were looking at. But if we're using unscopables instead, it's no longer devoid yeah. of properties, right? So this is still my initial suggestion was still using uh, getters. So. Oh, you still have to have the getter in order to do the deletion. That that's less attractive. That doesn't actually solve it. No, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, uh, oh. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't leaving it in place. I was also using a getter. Ah, but no, no but the uh, the feral eval is still remains reachable. Um, uh, you're just you're depend you're depending only on unscopables uh, to not the reference it, but it remains reachable. And this has the same. This has the same issue. Yeah. So. 
so I hear you about the 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 bumping the stack problem. Ugh. Um, Hmm. I believe that the only way to avoid the bumping the stack problem is to be very careful to bump the stack to exactly the same amounts when we install the when we when we flip the switch. Um, at least as much. Uh, to so at least think, yeah. you could you could yeah. bump, you could uh, you could try more and uh, and if you succeed at more you know the the subsequent one will succeed. So yeah, yeah. So for, I, I for for a naive interpreter, I I believe that for a JIT system where we just don't know what weird optimizations it might be doing on one path and not the other. Um, it's hard to know that we've actually allocated enough stack in the one case to cover the allocation that happens in the other case. It might be that they optimize the first one away. So the reason why I'm content with what Aaron has, uh, has implemented is that deleting eval off of the eval scope is probably as close to zero function calls as we can get. And that is reliably on the correct side of this balance. Like if, say, if we can ensure that there's zero function calls in order to, to eliminate the eval property, uh, then any number uh, of function calls on the, on the defined side should be fine. Let's take a look at Kumabis's quadruple black flip code again. <coughs> Uh, let's let's take a look at the quadruple black flip itself. Yeah, over there. Um, so on all existing engines, I believe if it actually does run out of stack memory, it throws an exception of some sort, correct? A range error specifically. Is that true across engines? Uh, I believe so. I don't know so. In which case? In yeah, the case I mean, we, yeah, we do have the, the, the catch in uh, around the evaluator, no? Oh, but you return feral function. OK, I see. No, never mind. What, well, what I'm thinking, what I'm thinking is um, that if error, if uh, Kamavis's getter blows the stack, it will be the inner width that throws. Correct. The will... innermost. Yes. Yes. Okay. If we put a try catch around that inner width. But it, it, there's already a try catch uh, around wherever this is called. Okay, but there's uh, many, th there's. All right, so this is wherever make evaluate factory is called. Um, right, so we get the evaluate here. Yeah. Or, so you get the evaluate and whenever we call evaluate, but evaluate uh, can can throw for many legitimate reasons. Yeah, but no matter what, even including the the the, the out of stack, and uh, that's the first thing we we do here. Uh, it triggers. Um, oh, I see. Oh, it triggers see. it and deletes oh, it. So, oh, yeah. I see. I see. So line 104 is the redundant delete of eval scope eval. We know that oh, it's already been deleted, okay. but there's no harm deleting it again, just to be sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, there actually is a, um, that delete right there, that's script code, correct? Uh, 
I believe so, but what is? Okay, is a, if the property is already absent, does a strict delete still succeed? I think it does. Yes, it doesn't throw if that's what you mean. I, it, I believe that's what the return value differs. Yeah. Okay, that's what I was worried about is it whether, whether it can throw, but it does not. Okay, good. Okay, okay, I'm satisfied. I, um, I think yeah. with this, I think with this delete, we're safe against the out of stack. So let's do this. Yeah, I I don't really see a way in, in how an out of stack on the getter uh, can can result in anything. The code in yeah. this finally block. Let me just make sure the code in this finally block. None of these four lines that we're looking at right here, um, none of those involve a function call. There's no hidden getters or anything. Oh, in case we are already out. Well, it yeah. does here. 103 uh, could trigger the same uh, uh, stack bump, actually. Can it? In, oh, in, right. In, Sir, so go ahead. Yeah, this is a case the in uh, eval scope will uh, actually no, it won't. Yeah, in does not invoke a getter. Only if it's a proxy, but yeah. Um, right. it, it, it'll cause a proxy trap if it's a proxy, but it will, but it's not going to invoke the getter on an access. Yeah, record. this check actually doesn't mean, mean anything. Unsafe eval was still exposed. Uh, that oh oh in eval scope if we deleted it. Okay, yeah yeah. We, we are capturing that just so that we can write a log. Okay, um, cool. Why why not get the return yeah, value of delete? Uh, let's test that. I think I think it might not give you what you want. Doesn't delete return? I'm, I'm testing it. Oh, I need to remember to turn on script and do it. Okay. Well, well, one thing is certain that if we, um, oh, no, we cannot reverse the order of these lines, obviously, but we might be able to collapse them as you suggest. Oh, I need to remember to send an invitation to the next meeting before that meeting starts. Now it returns true whether the property exists or not. Yeah. Why? So uh, wait, what, uh, where are the cases where it returns false then, or does it ever return? What is uh, so in strict? This is this, this, this actually does what I was was I was worried that my memory was was fallible here because it's been many years, but uh, in strict code, delete only ever either returns true or throws. It never a strict, a strict delete can never return false. When does it throw? Uh, it throws if it fails, to, if the property itself continues to exist. So, so, it, so the delete succeeds if following the delete, the property uh -huh. is absent. Whether it's absent because it was deleted or it's absent because it wasn't there in the first place, the delete doesn't care. In both cases, it's a success. And if the property is not absent, then the delete has failed, and in strict a strict delete will then throw, and a non strict and a sloppy delete will return false. I blame maps <laughs> for twisting my views. All right, um, okay, so we can't quell as this, uh, but this is safe because yeah, okay, yeah. So um, so I so I like I like Kamavis's version because it lets now that we've known that that we're safe against the stack attack stack attack. Um, now that we know we're safe against the stack attack, the um, uh, Kamavis version allows us to reason about safety from reachability, which is great. 
Do we know that we're safe from the from the stack attack? I think. Well, we just. It'd be nice to have a test for this, but um, somehow you got to build a stack that is up to the bumping limit, and then backtrack, and then yeah, and trigger this. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that. I mean. If I didn't want credit for it, I think I'd like to call this the Davis device because alliteration is awesome. <laughs> Whereas the stack attack is just a wrong. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I still prefer stack bumping, <laughs> but stack attack is great. <laughs> well, the stack bumping is the, is the external name if you do a literature search. That's what you'll come up. You know that will give you the hits. Oh, the Davis device is the is is the mechanism here that defends against the stack attack. So D Davis device versus stack attack. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, Richard, is stack attack the one that you will find in literature? I no, uh, stack bumping. What? <laughs> I thought I made that up. Wait, no. I did make it up. <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe you did. Uh, <laughs> once again. <laughs> Once again, <laughs> nothing in is new in this world. Okay. Um, so, I mean, again, this is not really specific to this approach, right? Like the the current eval was also susceptible to this, and we went through some hoops to try not to trigger this, but. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we can ask for a new test just for this <laughs> in this PR in this code. We we yeah we, we can't make it a a, a, yeah. a condition on on admitting the PR, but we should we definitely should ask for a test. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're looking for a stack bumping test. Yeah, I think we should have a stack bumping test, but that's independent of this refactor. I feel really, I would feel really great to have us if we had a stack bumping test, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, I think this comment, my comment still stands that I feel uncomfortable leaving the caller to add, but then the caller is deleting directly, so I don't know. It's... So, so, so should I? Uh, again, would you? Would that particular concern be alleviated if we inlined the creative eval scope where it's being used, so that it's clear that the responsibility is in the same unit of code? Yeah, I am concerned about inlining uh, the getter and stuff and capturing. Uh, things in the scope. Here, the advantage is the only thing in, in scope is eval scope. So we're not going to be leaking whatever else is. I mean, the other concern is memory leaks, basically. <laughs> like this is this is a closure. And I don't want this closure to just hang around shit. Ah, yes. So you would prefer it in this form, even though it doesn't mitigate I don't know. I don't know what to prefer. <laughs> okay. I, Googling the phrase stack bumping uh, on the first page of answers gets me nothing. Okay. So I need to write a paper really quick. I'll be right back. <laughs> oh, stack banging. Uh, this is being recorded. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come up with it. I'm just quoting Google. Yeah, I don't see anything. All right. Um... <laughs> Mark, what's your Airdosh number? You want to co author it? <laughs> <laughs> I want to this. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Um, yeah, so there's, yeah, money lines on 39 to 41. This is yeah. where we get. Scope Terminator. So here is um, the first change. Like, no, it's Scope Terminator, as uh, Chris was mentioning earlier. It can be either uh, a shared Scope Terminator if you're in strict mode, because the only purpose of that thing is to just deny all, um, or a, a pair compartment uh, scope terminator that is linked to the global object of the compartment. And most code is going to be in uh, strict uh, globals mode, uh, which means we can just have a single shared uh, scope terminator proxy that denies all and doesn't leak nothing. So um, it, does it has return false? Even for things that are on the on the realm global. No, as as we said, it. Uh, I mean, we can go find it, but um, this doesn't change the beha current behavior, which only returns false for uh, for things that are not on the global, that are on the globals, uh, that are okay. not like ground global. Okay, I do. I mean, if we're doing this this much of an invasive change, um, I think I would like to either understand why we can't have what the, you know what the trouble was that Kamavas got into by having that one have has always returned true. Well, this uh, is attempting to be a pure refactor without minimizing the amount of behavioral changes. I see. I, there are some behavioral changes, but uh, they're either bug fixes or um, or things that I, I, we we will will look will look in the tests, but uh, things that couldn't be uh, dealt with another way. Well, if we don't fix it in this PR, I would like to fix it in, in an immediately following PR. right. And not do a release with one of those PRs and not the other. Um, if that's if that's the constraint, then I would insist on it being in one PR, but also a separate commit. Okay, I, I'm I'm more comfortable with that as well. My yeah, my um, as a rule, we should not have the master branch in an unreleasable state for any amount of time. Yeah. So there were questions about um, the optimizer objects and how currently I believe uh, Kumavis is creating an optimizer object which combines uh, the properties of the global object and global lexical, which feels inefficient. Okay, so so um, the key thing about the Sign. Hold on, I don't. I don't understand the code I'm looking at. I am wondering. Um, if there is so, if we look, if we look here at, uh, we have a single optimizer block. I guess the point is to go through the optimizer before eval scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. 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 Didn't we? I, I think we should have two optimizer. Um... So, so it would a valid a valid alternative to this would, in fact, as you say, Matthew, for the optimizer to have two, either have two optimizers or two, or have the optimizer have two clauses within it, one for extracting properties from global lexicals and one for extracting properties of global object. The difference in code would be that the optimizer generator would have to be careful to make sure that the lexical lexicals overshadow the global object. So the global object optimizer would have to um, omit any key that's already in the lexicals. But that's and the that, thing. Would, that would be equivalent. The optimize like right now, there's already a logic in figuring out which optimizer 
uh, which symbols are optimizable. Uh, it's again, it's this feels like a bit of a split brain uh, thing where pieces of it are, and I don't remember where this was. Um, Scroll, when you were scrolling up, I saw the this dot um, optimizer properties, which I think illuminates what's going on here. Let me, let me just double check that um, besides the shadowing calculation, which is of course right. uh, very important, there's also it's all, so something's only optimizable if the property itself is non write is a non writable non configurable data property. That's true. It also can it also has to be a valid identifier, and it also cannot be the string eval. Okay. Good. 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 Um, all right, so I mean the optimizer right now is pretty dumb. It just takes a list of constants which are uh, the names. Uh, it could very well take two lists of constants, uh, which are the lexical constant and the uh, global constants. Uh, or we could build two optimizers. Oh no, we can't build two optimizers because the optimizer object differs. Yeah, we would we would have to change the optimizer to generate two clauses. So I don't understand what what's gained by having two clauses, because they're already uh, because the shadowing calculation they're already entangled. Yeah, the the only advantage is that we wouldn't have to merge global this and global lexicals into the optimizer object, which is the line that we were looking at, which 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 uh, seems uh, overwrought. Ah, uh, uh, got it. Like I, I would push the, I, I would just change the logic of wherever the constants are generated um, to generate two lists of constants, one for the, because that already is aware of uh, where, uh, where is this? So uh, I, I'm fine with that. I, I I would like that. I think that Aaron was just deferring it as optimization yeah. work we could postpone. Make constants, so let's make it a little bit factory. Constants here. Yeah, so basically um, split, you return two lists of constants here that we pass in. Okay. Because it's already aware of both. So I think I'm going to write something to that effect. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was right above. OK. So so and get scope constants would be refactored to return global constant or object constant, global object constants and global lexical constants. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK. Now Go ahead. Yeah. So the once we've built an evaluator, uh, uh, what's I remember this changed over the life of Sess, the session. Um, what's the reuse of a evaluator? Um, you know, when do when do we calculate the constants, and then what's the lifetime for reusing it versus rebuilding it? Um, uh, Matthew changed this last. The I believe that the answer is that we reuse the evaluator if we can. And we um, and that basically depends on whether the global lexicals. Um... Sorry, the dog was being very loud. So, what was the question again? The uh, question is what? What is the light? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, when do we calculate the constants, and then what is the lifetime for reuse of that of the resulting evaluator versus calculating a new one? Yeah, so the constants or the evaluator is uh, generated uh, lazily the first time uh, any evaluation is done in the compartment uh, mm -hmm. for uh, function and eval. Um, and then I guess for evaluation when there are 
uh, new global lexicals for so modules. Uh, the evaluator is rebuilt uh, because it's a different set of global lexicals. And then the, after the first time it's built uh, with the same set of uh, basically of constant, uh, uh, the same the same global lexicals objects, I think, uh, it is never rebuilt. So it's cached. So the idea is you can build your compartment. You can go in and set up the global disk on the compartment and freeze them uh, and, and, and do everything there. And then you evolve. And at that point, uh, this is when the optimizer is built. So you have an opportunity to have an optimizer that does something. Uh, but if you go in and modify your global after that, uh, it won't take advantage of the optimizer anymore. OK, so if I eval and then freeze the globals and then eval again, I miss out on all the optimization. Uh, on the new, on, for the new, yeah. the added properties, yes. OK. And the different modules within the same compartment have different lexicals. They, well, they have to because we're using it for right. the, um, so do we, so they, they create a new evaluator. So at that they, point, uh, they, they create they a new evaluator, which they keep around on a per module basis. Yes. Okay. I believe so. It's not the case that if I evaluate module A and then I evaluate module B and then I evaluate module A again, that evaluating module B caused the A optimizer to be thrown away and then rebuilt. Um, hold on one sec. I I think that we're just in practice. The evaluator is just thrown away, right? Because we it just end up calling compartment evaluate with a new uh, thing, but then it uh, will never call that again. I don't remember what I'm caching here. I think the cache is based. It's it's going to be a throwaway. I believe it's going to be a throwaway evaluate uh, evaluator at that point. Okay. Okay. It's, uh, it's the same for sloppy go globals. Uh, if you do an evaluate with a different sloppy go globals, with sloppy global sets, it will just create a new eval evaluator. OK. OK. And creating the evaluator, there's nothing very expensive about it. So that should be fine. Um, I mean, yeah, I think, yeah. Matthew? Um, yeah. You're we're coming up on time. Would you mind yeah. wrapping up this comment and, and yeah. submitting a partial review so that we can have this as the input for our next meeting? Yes. We'll do that. Um, and I think uh, I think that the next step for us in this review would be to look at how the tests have changed. Um, and I don't recall whether Aaron has already rebased this on top of the other pull request that simply adds more tests that pass. Yeah, it would be nice to start the next meeting looking at the, uh, or in the next meeting looking at the test differences. Uh, what was I writing? One for uh, each. Well, that's probably good enough. Uh, three comments. What else? I guess I must have had added something else. Why is the optimizer outside? The, can we move the optimizer um, interpolation into the strict code? Right now, it's in the sloppy region. Um, the, one of the side effects of that would mean that um, declaring any variable in the scope of a module or program that has the same name as an optimized function would be a, a name collision in the scope. Um, in the name of in the scope of the eval code, where um, currently it just overshadows the. Optimizer. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's why it's there, but it certainly is one good reason. <laughs> okay. What is the concern with uh, it not being in the with uh, it not with it being in the no, mode? No, it, it would it would actually still shadow because that's a strict direct eval. 
which has its which 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 has a uh, it's 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 as, as if it's surrounded by open curly closed curly. It's its own nested block scope. So uh, I think I think yeah I think we could move line sixty seven down below line sixty nine. Oh. Oh, oh, so eval has a block scope, so it's still overshadows, I see. Yeah. Uh, so what, what is, at that point, this will be reevaluated every time. Ah, you're correct. That's a reason to keep it outside. You're right. What is the concern with a strict mode here? Oh, it's just... You know, anytime we have anything written in sloppy code, I get very nervous because uh, sloppy code is sloppy. It's just, it just, it's much harder to remember all of the weird semantics of sloppy mode. Yeah, but in this, in, this case, in this case, it's pretty safe. Um, it's just, if if everything else were equal, I would prefer it to be strict. But as as you point out. Everything else is not equal. We want to do the optimization once, not once per invocation. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, we, we could achieve that with another iffy. Um, yeah, double. Yeah. Uh, double in any like case, we're at, we're at time and have another great meeting look, to look forward to. I'll, I'll see you on the other side. <laughs>